So how do we identify all of these beta lactamases that we've discussed? Well, our first clue, as usual, is going to be phenotypic. So we're going to see resistance to a broad spectrum of beta-lactam type drugs. Once we have our suspect broad spectrum beta-lactamase producer, we can identify them using some phenotypic tests. So in the case of the ESBLs, we can look at synergy with clavulanic acid and cephalosporins. We can look at cefoxetin susceptibility, so the ESBLs do not degrade our cefamycins, and then also as trionum resistance. For the carbapenemases, there's some older tests, um, either the modified Hodge test. Here what we have is a lawn of a uh, highly susceptible organism that will easily be killed by a drug like meropenem. And then in towards that disc, we put streaks of our organisms that we suspect is producing a carbapenemase. What you can see in the case of this streak here and the one on the right is that our susceptible bacteria grows in along that streak of our carbapenemase producer. So what's happening is this test organism is producing an enzyme, it's degrading the drug, and that's allowing our susceptible organism um, to grow closer to the disc than it would otherwise be able to. On the bottom here, we have a non-carbapenemase producer, so it's resistant by some other mechanism, and you can see that our susceptible organism isn't able to grow any closer to the disc. We also have inhibitor-based tests, so this is the MAST ID system where we have um, a carbapenem along with various inhibitors. And then more recently, we've had the development of lateral flow assays like the CARBA-5. All of these phenotypic assays can then be confirmed with genotypic tests such as PCR and sequencing, or increasingly just whole genome sequencing of the isolate. On the bottom left here, I've put in a table that sort of at a very high level summarizes uh, the susceptibility profiles we see with various types of uh, beta-lactamases. So non-ESBL, TEM, and SHV type enzymes. We're going to see resistance to penicillins and first-generation cephalosporins. For our ESBLs, we'll see resistance to those two, plus third-generation cephalosporins and astreonum. And then our AMP-C type enzymes, so CMY, we'll see resistance to penicillin, first and third generation cephalosporins, our cefamycin, so cefoxetin, potentiated penicillins, so amoxicillin clavulanic acid, and astreonum. In the next few slides, I want to describe some of the research projects that we've done in our lab uh, looking at ESBLs um, here in Western Canada. And the first one that I wanted to talk about uh, is a study that we did looking at wild birds. So at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, members of the public will often bring in animals that they find injured or are concerned about for evaluation and rehabilitation. And this gave us an opportunity to sample 75 birds, including 25 crows, 29 American robins, and 21 great horned owls. The way that we conducted this study was to collect cloacal swabs from these animals prior to any treatment. And those swabs were then plated out on McConkie agar and Chromagar ESBL for the selective isolation of uh, E. coli and ESBL producers. From these birds, we found both SHV and CTXM type ESBLs. And what was really interesting is that when we looked at where these birds originated, there was a significant association between the presence of resistant E. coli and birds that came from the city as opposed to those from a rural origin perhaps indicating that um, these animals are picking up resistant organisms from the human environment. It's maybe more about us than it is about uh, the animals themselves. If we look at this table here, you can see the susceptibility profiles. So the majority of the isolates were susceptible to all drugs tested, but we had a few nasty multi-drug resistant organisms, including the CTXM15 producer from a crow, and these SHV2A producers uh, from another crow. This study also suggested to us that crows are potentially a good sentinel for resistance in urban areas, as they're really interested in the human environment. They're digging through garbage cans, they're curious, they're sort of mischievous, and they may give us an opportunity to subsample kind of what's going on in the city more broadly. Next is a longitudinal study that we've been doing since 2013 and are continuing today, um, looking at E. coli causing urinary tract infections in dogs. 
So we've been collecting these samples from the diagnostic lab here at the college. Um, and in the first five years of the study, we had 625 isolates. We determined their MICs by broth microdilution. And then for any organisms which were resistant to the beta-lactams, we went looking for beta-lactamases by PCR. Um, the results of the first few years of this study are published in the Canadian Veterinary Journal, and more recently, the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine. A quick high-level summary, um, here you can see a histogram of the frequency of resistance to many of the drugs that we tested over five years. So on the x-axis, we have our various drugs. These are all of our beta-lactams here. And then on the y-axis, we have the percentage of isolates that were resistant. So from zero up to about 16% for ampicillin. What really stood out to me about this study is that we have a very low frequency of resistance overall. Really, resistance to all of our drugs, with the exception of ampicillin resistance, is found in less than 10% of isolates. So this is a good news story when it comes to the emergence of resistance. We can still use first-line therapies here in Western Canada for treating uh, canine urinary tract infections. Looking at that same five years worth of data, um, rather than on a drug-by-drug -drug basis, looking at the susceptibility profiles, um, what you can see here is um, each of our five years, and then the different phenotypes that we're seeing. So approximately 80% of our isolates were susceptible to all drugs tested, which is really, really fantastic news. Somewhere around 5% were multidrug resistant, so that indicates resistance to three or more classes of antibiotics. And then we did identify some broad-spectrum beta-lactamase producers as well, some CTXM enzymes in sort of 0 to 1.5%, and CMY2, which is an AMP-C beta-lactamase, with a slightly higher frequency. When we look at those strains which were resistant to our third-generation cephalosporins, um, we saw some really interesting patterns. So this is a, a really big table with a lot of data. Um, on the far left, we have our isolate ID, the year in which it was collected, the resistance phenotype, and then on the right, we have the resistance genes that were identified. And I think what the take-home message is here is that multidrug resistant isolates are found, they're infrequent, but their presence indicates that susceptibility testing can be really helpful for selecting a therapy. We've also done some research into foods. Um, so antimicrobial resistance surveillance is frequently done on domestically produced uh, meat products here in Canada and in many other countries. But we were really interested in looking at uh, other types of foods, things that are imported and maybe aren't captured by current surveillance programs. So we looked for E. coli's and salmonella's, which are really common targets of resistant surveillance. And then we also looked a little bit more broadly. So we looked for organisms which were resistant regardless what species they were. So we called this sort of our taxa independent uh, surveillance culture. And this was really the um, novel addition to the studies that we've done. So in our first investigation that I'm going to describe, we looked at what we called culinary reptiles and amphibians. And this is all published data. So if you're interested to learn more, you can find this paper. We purchased 53 samples from niche markets in Saskatoon and Vancouver including dried toke geckos, dried snakes, a dried turtle carapace, some frozen frog legs, and frozen softshell turtles. It was really interesting to note that country of origin labeling was not present on 22 of the samples, and that the remainder were from China and Thailand. Just to give you an idea of what these products looked like, um, here you can see our dried snakes, our dried toke geckos, and then our frozen softshell turtles. It was quite interesting. Um, what really stood out to us is that some of the softshell turtles were actually sold ungutted. Um, when you buy other meat products in Canada, chicken or beef or pork, um, you don't have the whole animal um, for sale at the grocery store. And from a food safety perspective, you can imagine that there's a very different level of hazard when dealing with some muscle tissue that's been uh, processed in a, a specialized uh, facility as opposed to an entire animal where we also have the intestines containing feces and all of the enteric uh, pathogens that are, are likely to be present. So what did we find? Well, E. coli's were not surprisingly very common in our turtles. 91% um, of them were positive. 
we found many ESBL producers. Um, frog legs, about 60% of those samples yielded an ESBL producer. Um, dried geckos were a common source of E. coli and salmonella. Um, I should say that these dried geckos were not always packaged in a way that we would do so for other meat products. And so we aren't able to say whether uh, the salmonella originated um, where the, the product was initially produced or whether perhaps it was um, contaminated at the point of sale, perhaps by flies landing on it. In this table here, what you can see is a summary of the frequency of resistance among uh, our E. coli isolates. So we have the drugs on the far left column, the percentage of isolates, the percentage of our E. coli that were resistant to each of those drugs, and then the percentage of our 53 samples from which a resistant organism was recovered, because we oftentimes save multiple strains uh, per sample. And what I just want to focus on is up here, these top five rows, these are all of our beta-lactams. And you can see that we do have some resistance to these drugs. So when we drilled down into these a little bit deeper, um, what you can see is that most of them originated from turtles. Um, in the center here, you can see the resistance profile. Each drug family is highlighted in a different color. So we have our beta-lactams in black, tetracyclines in green, chloramphenicol in red, aminoglycosides in blue, sulfonamides in yellow, and quinolones in purple. And what this really, I think, helps to highlight is that the more colorful a row is, the more multi-drug resistant uh, a particular isolate is. And then on the far right, we have the beta-lactamase genes that we found, um, CTXM55, 65, and 18, as well as CMY2 were identified. One organism that we were really interested in uh, was this particular E. coli from a turtle, uh, where additional testing revealed um, colistin resistance and actually the presence of MCR1, which is a, a mobile colistin resistance gene that's found on a plasmid. Finally, because we looked at organisms that just grew on a carbapenem containing agar, regardless what they were, we also identified an acinetobacter species resistant to essentially all of the beta-lactams we tested, and it turned out to possess NDM1. The follow-up to this study was to look at some plant-based products. And again, this one was uh, published just a couple of years ago. We purchased 143 samples from 17 countries from niche markets in Saskatoon. Um, these samples originated in Asia, Africa, and one from Jamaica. Most commonly, um, samples came from either India or China. And these were really a wide variety of, of different foods. So there were vegetables, spices, herbs, fruits, um, a total of 77 different products, many of which were frozen and some were sold dried. So here you can see just some of the examples of, of things that we found, um, jute leaves, some vegetable mixes, spices, etc. Overall, we found E. coli from approximately 10% of the samples. Salmonella was also identified, Enterobacter species, Klebsiella, Staph aureus, including MRSA, and many of the samples contained Enterococcus, although none of them, fortunately, were vancomycin resistant. If we look at our gram negatives, um, resistant to third generation cephalosporins, this is a, a summary of what we found. So E. coli was found in chopped spinach and hyacinth bean seeds from China and Bangladesh, um, producing CTXM15s. We had Enterobacter cloacae and orogenes uh, with CTXM15 and 27, as well as plasmid mediated quinolone resistance genes, and then CTXM and SHV producing. Uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae from a variety of other vegetable products. So with that very high level summary of beta-lactamases, um, the take-home messages that I want you to walk away from this lecture with is that broad-spectrum beta-lactamases are increasingly common in gram-negatives in the community. It's not just in, in hospital settings. They're increasingly common in uh, organisms that cause infections in otherwise healthy individuals. So in E. coli's that cause UTIs in healthy women and also in healthy animals. These beta-lactamases are oftentimes found on plasmids, which means that they're mobile. They can be transmitted between organisms via horizontal gene transfer, multi-drug resistance, and fortunately still rarely pan-resistance, so resistant to everything, 
is becoming more common and unfortunately the new norm. And then finally, and particularly relevantly for you as future practitioners, is that susceptibility profiles are highly variable. Laboratory guidance is very, very important, so you need to submit those cultures for susceptibility testing to help guide your therapeutic selection. I don't have any new terms for today, but I do have a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.